Who was Queen Elizabeth? By June Eating, illustrated by Nancy Harrison. Who was Queen Elizabeth? England, August 1588. A fleet of powerful Spanish warships is sailing toward England. The Spanish fleet, called the Armada, has 130 mighty ships. Each is heavily armed. Their goal is to invade the island nation. King Philip of Spain wants to be King of England as well. But England's ruler is brave and fearless. She is Queen Elizabeth. She does not intend to let the Spanish king take her throne. Her soldiers are waiting on the coast of England. They are ready to defend their country. The queen's advisors do not want her anywhere near a battle. They worry about her safety. But Elizabeth does not listen. The queen sets off on horseback from London to where the soldiers have set up camp. Elizabeth wants to be with her men. If there is a battle, words from the queen herself will help lead her men to victory. The queen rides up on a great horse. She passes among the crowd of soldiers. She wants everyone to hear words spoken from her heart. The queen says she is there to live or die amongst you. Elizabeth is telling her soldiers that, even though she is queen, she is willing to die with them. She ends by saying, I know I have the body of but a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and of a king of England, too. With tears in her eyes, the queen promises, we shall shortly have a famous victory over our enemies. And she is right. The English ships are smaller than the Spanish ships. But they set many Spanish ships on fire and break up the enemy fleet. And the English also get lucky there is very bad weather. Spanish ships try to flee and instead crash against England's rocky shore. They are destroyed. England is saved. People throughout the country rejoice. They call their brave Elizabeth Good Queen Bess. For the rest of her life and long after her death, Elizabeth's faithful and loving people would rejoice that she was their queen. Chapter 1 Young Elizabeth On September 7, 1533, a baby girl was born in a palace in Greenwich, England. Her father was King Henry VIII, a handsome man who loved to hunt, to eat and drink, and to be in the company of beautiful women. Her mother, Queen Anne, was young and very beautiful indeed. The baby had her father's bright red hair and pale skin. When she was only three days old, the little princess was brought to church. She wore a long dress of silk and lace. Over it, a tiny robe trimmed in fur kept her warm. One of the king's officers announced her arrival dashed the high and mighty Princess Elizabeth. It was a very grand occasion. The truth, however, was that Elizabeth's father was not at all happy over her birth. King Henry wanted a child of his to rule after him. But he did not want Elizabeth to be queen. Certainly a woman could not rule a country all by herself besides, Henry already had one daughter from his first marriage. Princess Mary was now seventeen years old. Queen and had promised Henry a boy. That's what Henry wanted. And Henry was a man who expected to get what he wanted. If he didn't, there could be big trouble. And soon there was. After the little princess was born, Henry was convinced that Queen and would never bear a son. So he accused her of a crime she did not commit and was put on trial and sentenced to death. Elizabeth was not even three years old when her mother was beheaded. Now King Henry was free to marry again. And within two weeks of Anne's death, he did. Luckily for the new queen, she gave birth to a baby boy. His name was Edward. What did this mean for little Elizabeth? It meant she was no longer important. In her father's eyes, she was no longer even a princess. She was sent away to a palace far from London. She hardly ever saw her father. Fortunately, Elizabeth had many loving people to look after her. 
there was her governess Catherine, called Cat. Elizabeth and Cat stayed friends long after Elizabeth grew up. Cat made sure that Elizabeth was happy and healthy. She also made sure that the king sent enough money for Elizabeth's needs food and clothes and books. Another important person in Elizabeth's life was Roger Ascombe. He was Elizabeth's private teacher. Although most girls in the 1500s had no schooling, Elizabeth was the daughter of a king. She was expected to read and write. Young Elizabeth was a quick learner. Ascombe called her the brightest star of all the girls he taught. Elizabeth sridied math, history, literature, astronomy, and geography. She especially loved to read and would spend hours with books in Greek and Latin. By the time she was a teenager, Elizabeth knew five languages besides English, French, Italian, Spanish, Greek, and Latin. Sometimes she and Ascom would speak to each other in Greek or Latin. Elizabeth learned to play an instrument called the virginal. It was like a piano. She started sewing when she was six and became very good at needlework. Other tutors instructed Elizabeth in horseback riding and dancing. There wasn't much time for play. And, like all children of that time, Elizabeth was expected to act like a tiny adult. Every once in a while, young Elizabeth would overhear gossip. Henry's third wife had died. Then he divorced his next wife and beheaded the one after that. It was very risky for a woman to be married to King Henry. As the years went by, Elizabeth grew into a serious, intelligent teenager. In a portrait of Elizabeth at the age of thirteen, she wears a simple yet beautiful red dress. It is one of the only portraits of young Elizabeth. A book lies open on a stand behind her. She is holding another book. Her finger marks the page. It seems as if she plans to start reading again as soon as the artist is finished painting. Despite growing up with no mother or father, Elizabeth was becoming an elegant and talented young woman. What Elizabeth did not know was that she would become the most important person in England. And it wouldn't be long before people powerful people would want her dead. Chapter 2 The Princess is a Prisoner When Elizabeth was thirteen, her father died. Prince Edward was only nine. Still, he became king. Sadly, Edward was often sick and died at the age of fifteen. Princess Mary, the oldest of Henry's three children, now became queen. Mary was already thirty-seven years old. Within a year, the new queen married Prince Philip of Spain. Like Mary, Philip was Catholic. The Catholic religion was very important to Mary. And she insisted that everyone else in England be Catholic as well. Those who didn't obey could be put to death. During her rule, more than 250 people were burned at the stake. The English people hated Mary. They called her Bloody Mary. Also, they resented that Mary had married Philip. They did not want a Spanish prince to have so much power over their country. As for Queen Mary, she resented her half-sister Elizabeth. She always had. After all, King Henry had divorced Mary's mother to marry Elizabeth's mother. Mary also did not trust Elizabeth. She thought Elizabeth was plotting to be queen. So she had Elizabeth thrown in jail. On a cold and rainy night, Elizabeth was sent by boat to the Tower of London. She was only nineteen years old. The boat passed under London Bridge. Above her, the heads of traitors were displayed on poles. Did the same fate await Elizabeth? The boat arrived at the steps that led up to her prison cell. At first, Elizabeth would not go. She knew there was no escape. But she wanted to make it clear to everyone that her punishment was not fair. She was innocent. So she sat down on the cold, wet stone steps. When she felt she had made her point, she rose and climbed to her cell. 
Elizabeth remained there for two months, never knowing from one day to the next if Mary planned to kill her. Elizabeth wrote to her sister Mary, declaring her innocence. But her letters were ignored. Finally Queen Mary released Elizabeth. Still, she had to live under house arrest for a year at a nearby palace. Elizabeth was watched closely. She learned to keep her thoughts to herself. As for Queen Mary, she was desperately trying to have a baby. She wanted to raise a Catholic child, one who would rule after her and make sure England stayed Catholic. But she remained childless. Then, her health started to fail. The Tower of London Almost a thousand years old and once surrounded by a moat, the tower was originally built to protect the city from invaders. Over the years, the Tower of London grew to include many buildings. At one point there was even a zoo within the tower yard. But the tower is most famous for being a prison. Many prisoners arrived by boat, passing through Trader's Gate. Many famous names in English history spent their last days at the tower. Elizabeth's own mother was sent to the tower and beheaded in a private courtyard. Today, the Tower of London is a popular tourist attraction. The crown jewels necklaces, rings, crowns, and tiaras that belong to British kings and queens are kept there on display. Queen Mary was forced to face the facts, Elizabeth would be queen after her. Still, Mary waited until she was on her deathbed to declare Elizabeth the new queen. It was November 17, 1558. Elizabeth was reading under an oak tree when two officers of the court rode up to her. One of the men presented Elizabeth with the royal ring. It was the one that Mary had worn. Elizabeth said a prayer of gratitude in Latin. She had survived Mary's rule. Now she was queen. Elizabeth was only twenty-five years old. From now on, she would answer to only one person, herself. Elizabeth was crowned Queen of England on January 15, 1559, in a famous London church called Westminster Abbey. Elizabeth wore a beautiful golden gown and a matching robe trimmed in white fur. As she sat on her throne, parts of the Bible were read aloud. This was to show that Elizabeth was a queen in God's eyes, too. Her power could not be questioned. In a portrait painted in honor of that day, Elizabeth has a scepter in her right hand. The scepter is a symbol of authority. In her left hand, she holds an orb. The way her hand grasps the orb is meant to show that her power reaches all over the world. In the painting, Elizabeth's long red hair is flowing. Her cheeks are slightly flushed. The new queen looks young and full of life. Already Elizabeth had learned a great deal. She knew how people close to her could turn against her. She would have to be careful and smart if she was going to remain queen. Chapter 3 The Young Queen The English people loved Elizabeth. On her first day as queen, she was carried through the streets of London in a great parade. Despite the cold, everyone in the city gathered outside people cheered. Church bells rang. Colorful flags and banners fluttered along her route. Music groups and troops of actors performed on special stages as the queen passed by. Elizabeth stopped again and again to greet people and thank them. The Queen's Progress Elizabeth liked to meet and greet her people. Most people lived in the countryside. So every summer, the Queen left London and took a long trip, visiting different towns throughout England. She must have enjoyed escaping from London, which was crowded, smelly, and often unhealthy in the summer. The Queen did not pack lightly. She traveled with more than 400 wagons and 2,500 packhorses. Along her route, the Queen stopped to greet her people. Elizabeth always found a way to show her love for them. Once, she stood in the rain to watch a little boy perform for her. Elizabeth stayed at the homes of the nobility. 
each family tried its hardest to impress the queen. Plays, banquets, and fireworks would go on for days. This was costly for noble families but worth the honor of playing host to the queen. Later there was a great banquet at Whitehall Palace. All members of the court were invited 800 guests attended. Dancing and feasting went on for hours. At one point a knight rode into the hall on his horse. To show his love for the queen, he threw down his glove. That act was a challenge. If any knight was disloyal to the queen, he had to fight the knight on horseback. No one wanted to fight, of course. The next day, Elizabeth awoke in Whitehall Palace. It was just one of her new homes. She had many different palaces all over England. But most of her time was spent at Whitehall Palace. Whitehall was already hundreds of years old. But Elizabeth's father had made improvements, adding arenas for tournaments and cockfights as well as tennis courts. Nevertheless, the rough stone walls of the castle made the rooms cold and damp. The only warmth came from roaring fires in giant fireplaces, there was no electricity, running water, or modern heat systems back then. Even during the day, rooms were dark. There were no large windows, because they let in drafts. Also, glass was expensive. Hundreds of candles were needed to provide light during the day as well as at night. Still, Elizabeth lived a life of luxury compared with that of her subjects. Most people worked on farms in the countryside and lived in two-room homes. Brick and stone were expensive, so the walls and roofs of the houses were strengthened with a mixture of clay and straw. Straw roofs kept houses warm, but they could catch fire easily. Rats and other creatures often made their homes in the straw, too. It was hard work just to survive. Because there was no electricity, people awoke with the sunrise and worked until nightfall. Anything that could not be grown or made by hand was bought at the weekly town market. Families even young children shared household chores. The queen certainly did not have to do chores. She had servants. Lots of servants. It took many people to keep a castle running. Wood was brought in for the fires. Water was pumped from wells and carried inside. A team of cooks and kitchen workers prepared the royal meals. The queen had servants to clean up after her. She had servants to make her bed, clean her room, and empty her chamber pot. There was no plumbing for toilets. Practically wherever she went, Elizabeth was surrounded by her ladies-in-waiting. These were young, unmarried women from noble families. It was their job to take care of all the queen's personal needs. They bathed and dressed her. They kept her company while she read or played music. It was a great honor to be a lady-in-waiting no payment was given. It might seem to the average person that the queen had an easy life. But Elizabeth said, to wear a crown is more glorious to them that see it than it is a pleasure to them that bear it. What she meant was that being a ruler the person who wore the crown was difficult. She knew her citizens depended on her for their safety and well-being, to protect them from enemies. As queen, Elizabeth had a great deal of power. The queen could make laws and declare wars. However, a lot of money was needed. Money came through taxes. To raise taxes, Elizabeth had to consult Parliament. Parliament was made up of the House of Commons, members from the lower classes, or common people, and the House of Lords, made up of bishops and noblemen. Elizabeth decided when to meet with Parliament and what would be discussed. In all the forty-four years she was Queen, she called Parliament into session only ten times. Instead, she relied on a group of advisers. They made up the Privy Council. The Privy Council. On important matters, Elizabeth turned to a group of men known as the Privy Council. They gave the king or queen advice about war, taxes, and news of other countries which rulers were friendly to England and which weren't. The Secretary of State was the most important person on the Privy Council. 
Elizabeth chose William Cecil for the job. Cecil had been Elizabeth's accountant, and the two were great friends. Together, Elizabeth and Cecil became a powerful team. He was 38 years old when he started working for the Queen, and he remained with her for 40 years, until the day he died. Elizabeth always demanded the truth from Cecil, even if it was bad news. Being Queen presented danger. There had been many plots against Queen Mary. Although Elizabeth was far more popular than Mary, she knew she had enemies. One member of Elizabeth's Privy Council, Sir Francis Walsingham, served as her eyes and ears. Elizabeth wanted to know everything, and Walsingham had spies all over Europe. He paid them for any news of plots against the Queen. Elizabeth did not really like Walsingham, but Walsingham was very loyal to her. He even spent his own money to pay for the spies. Just as her father had, Elizabeth slept in a bedroom right next to the room where the council met. Many times Elizabeth called the council in the middle of the night. Her advisors had to be ready at any moment to serve their queen. Chapter 4 Always the Same What was the country that Elizabeth ruled like? England in the mid-50s.